Hello everyone, it's Jake from Jams and Tea, and today I'm coming at you with a video that's a little different. Last year, my podcast co-host Riley made a video of five ambient albums that they felt you should hear, be it because they are under-discussed in the current canon of electronic ambient music, or just gateway records that people looking to get into that genre might be able to use to explore further into an area of music they might not be familiar with. And because, generally speaking, we on the podcast are champions of country music and what I'm going to be talking about today, alternative country music, I wanted to come out with a video that basically does the exact same thing. Because for as ubiquitous as streaming has made all kinds of music these days, I still feel like country music gets a bit of a bad rep. And I obviously understand why. The contemporary popular releases are oversaturated with commercialization and, you know, crossover stuff that just it doesn't give you a very flattering image or just reaffirms your current biases that you might have about this kind of music. So what I've selected here are a handful of records that represent areas where alternative country music is blended with other genres, as it often is, so that maybe people who are more on the outside looking in can use some of these records to basically open themselves up to a world of new possibilities for their listening habits. And also things that are rooted enough in country music to still give you a good idea of what it sounds like. Alt country is something that has technically existed for a long time, mainly because a lot of classic artists and classic albums have kind of been retrofitted with the label of alt country as far back as people like Willie Nelson could be considered alternative country, but this only really became a movement in the late 80s and early 90s, I would say, and it's performed typically by artists who want to blend the established tropes and sounds of country music with indie rock and alternative rock, just stuff that feels like it's a bit more mainstream and might play to some more, I guess, understandable and less alien roots than what the typical country norm might have you be used to in terms of what it's actually built out of. This is an interesting area of music for me because of how versatile it's grown. And I feel like that, yes, just because we are oversaturated with a lot of commercialized music in this genre, we're also kind of in a golden era for it, in a way, where a lot of new contemporary artists, lots of interesting smaller indie artists on stuff like Bandcamp, for instance, are blending these ideas and taking from all of these different places and blending it into something really, really unique. So, for as much as I want to shout out a bunch of underappreciated artists, this is purely a list of things that are either decently well acclaimed or middle of the road enough for some people to be familiar with it. I wanted to give you an honest idea of what you are in for when it comes to this stuff, but also something that is largely accessible. So, without further ado, here are six alternative country albums that you need to hear. We're gonna start off our list here with modern country music's critical golden boy, Jason Isbell. With Isbell, there's no shortage of great records to pick out. Southeastern is an album that we're going to talk about because it's celebrating its 10 year anniversary this year. And the follow up to that, Something More Than Free, my personal favorite Jason Isbell album is deeply underrated. And that's not to mention the fact that he was in the band Drive By Truckers before he did his solo work, which I recommend to basically anyone who is already a fan of country music and alternative country, just because their work, especially their early work, should be considered classic staples in this world. And while Jason wasn't at the forefront of that band, he is one of the reasons that they are as great as they are. But the reason I'm not recommending a Drive By Truckers album is that those tend to run very long. They're very ambitious, they're very conceptual, and they have some voices literally, like, 
the sound of some of their voices could probably be grating to some newcomers, so I picked the album that I feel like is the most beginner-friendly, 2017's The Nashville Sound. This is basically the easiest record on here to enjoy because it's one of modern country music's best doing what he does best, with the added instrumental muscle of a backing band that provides a sort of instrumental versatility to this project that both stays true to country music's roots and probably appeals to the more indie rock side of whatever your listening habits typically tend to steer towards. We've been vocal advocates of Jason since we covered his at least right now, most recent record, Reunions, which is also a really great album and not a bad place to start, but that starts to steer towards progressive country and blues in a way that feels a little bit dishonest to the purpose of this list, where I feel like Nashville Sound sticks to the fundamentals a little bit stronger. This is a record that just contains 10 fantastic songs. If We Were Vampires may even be my favorite Jason Isbell song, though it's a it's a really, really tough call to make. A melancholy, downtrodden ballad that explores the inherent tragedy of getting older with somebody you love. It's not in a saccharine or overly sentimental way. That's what Jason does best, as a matter of fact. He puts his emotions to the forefront of his songwriting, but never loses sight of where his perspective fits into the bigger picture. But this is still an album that, despite the fact that it was made in collaboration with the 400 unit, really does feel very personal. There are songs on here like Anxiety, where Jason details the struggles of his mental health, and in country music tradition, there are stories of very specific places in the South, like Cumberland Gap, a place I'm very familiar with that just really goes for the throat on the rockier side of this angle. This basically has everything you could want in a country music release. It just has the ballads, it has the straightforward rockers, it has the, the classic sort of immortal feeling standard tunes. This manages to feel like one of the most holistic Jason Isbell projects. It's the one I can recommend the most easily to people, and because it shows you that sort of softer side of Jason where he explores the machismo and masculinity of country music and deconstructs it in a way that feels very honest to artists like Hank Williams Jr. or Willie Nelson, for instance. It's certainly of its kind and might take a bit of getting used to, but everything on here is so well-rounded and solid. It does feel like a lot of these arrangements are intricate and detailed, but at the same time, it's very within its own lane, and that's why it's probably one of the easier records to get into this world of music. Next up on the list, we're going to talk about an artist that the podcast has been championing ever since we got to cover his record in 2020, Shape and Destroy, Rustin Kelly. While he has been a writer for bigger people in the country music world, he didn't really break through until 2018's Dying Star, and even then, I wouldn't necessarily say that his albums and songs have really caught on in the way that I feel like they should have, because like Jason Isbell, Rustin Kelly is a very accessible artist, but he's a bit more on the periphery of country music. While certainly an alt-country artist, he's pulling from a lot of different disparate sounds that blend his influences into a bit more of a hodgepodge of equal volumes of indie rock, Americana, folk, pop, all this kind of stuff synthesized into maybe what is the most accessible album here sound-wise to a general audience. Like, Rustin's songwriting is very poppy, it is very hook-driven, but that's the cool thing about him, is that he kind of hooks you in with all of these very sharply written songs and memorable stanzas, and then keeps you there with the verses, with the storytelling, and most notably with Dying Star, just the weathered sense of an emotional journey. This is a character portrait of 
Rustin in the early stages of his life where he was at his lowest, and Dying Star, as a result, is a real fucking bummer. It's about drinking, it's about drugs, it has a lot of content on here that maybe if you struggle or are triggered by some of these topics, I would be very careful about approaching it because his description thereof is frequently very ugly and self-flagellating, but at the same time, this album has songs like Cover My Tracks, Mockingbird, Faceplant, Blackout, which certainly do veer on the sides of emotional darkness, particularly Blackout, but simply don't sacrifice their pop appeal, to be sure. Rustin's voice is that perfect combination of weathered, but also beautiful. I don't know how they manage to consistently mix his voice to sound like he's a guy that basically gargles gravel, but has such a traditionally pretty, traditionally melodious inclination the way he does. I think any fan of Rustin Kelly will tell you that this is one of his chief appeals, other than that emotionally bare songwriting. There are moments on here that do get a little bit more ambitious instrumentally. There are a lot of electronic flourishes on this album that are very unexpected, even for alt country, in my opinion, that he hasn't really revisited yet, with that quintessential unique brand of, as Rustin dubs it, dirt emo, whether you want something to scream along to into your car when you're just in tears and feeling like shit, or if you just want something more traditionally catchy and fun, Rustin's got you covered. As a statement, Dying Star feels like it's Rustin at his most definitive and developed, and that's why I recommend it so enthusiastically. Now that we've gotten two more accessible entries out of the way, we're gonna get into the weirder shit and talk about an album from a band that is the result of one of alternative country's best musical mind, Woven Hand's Blush Music. Woven Hand is one of the many musical projects of Mr. David Eugene Edwards, and basically like almost every entry on this list, I'm kind of using this as an excuse to endorse the artist's catalog as a whole, but I wanted to single out Blush Music specifically, the sophomore album from Woven Hand, because I feel like this maybe has the most far-reaching appeal for a certain kind of music listener. If you're the more online, inclined type of person who pays attention to lots of more depressive stuff, like Have a Nice Life, very specifically the self-titled Giles Corey, which is an album that I find deeply analogous to the music of Woven Hand, or a band like Current 93 that dabbles in psychedelic folk occasionally, then this is 100% for you. Because while Blush Music is certainly an alternative country record, it is also a premier example of a gothic record. It is drenched in gothic Americana, very specifically, which is a much wider world of music than I think a lot of people might first assume that it is, and this is simply a great way to get into it. Woven Hand are a curious project because I think they are most closely comparable to a band like Current 93, for example, where building atmospheres within a song is just as important as the more fundamental, muscular aspects of song construction and songwriting, in that Woven Hand tend to really geared towards sound design more than anything else. That is an element here that is almost music concrete in nature, the way that so many of the songs here were just sort of build an environment as much as talk about that environment, and it creates a really immersive experience. And there's also just some really wild left field creative decisions that are made on here, particularly with the second song, a 14 minute long Bill Withers cover of Ain't No Sunshine entitled Animalitos, which is fantastic. It contains the sort of 
bluesy sorrow of the original version, but adds a kind of momentum to it, which is funny just because the song is so long. It's certainly a slower experience, but the way that it just gradually builds itself and becomes more rhythmic as the song goes along, it's tantalizing to listen to. This has got to be one of my favorite covers of all time. And the rest of the album is no less impressive. And it's mostly because of, again, that tangible, thick atmosphere, which is complemented beautifully by David Eugene Edwards as, as a vocal presence. You know, I've already talked about two guys who have probably more typical vocal presences that you would expect. They have the things that make them cool and unique within their own scene, but they're still very much within that niche. Whereas David Eugene Edwards, vocally speaking, reminds me of somebody who would be in like a post-punk revival band, which is a very curious combination, but it creates something that's super immediate. And while he has a drawl and a twang that he can accentuate, it's still something that I find a little bit quicker to be able to get into the groove of. So if you can kind of look past the admittedly intimidating length of this project, there's something darker, more ornamental, and more atmospheric about this record that you might not be used to from stuff from this scene. So if you're into some of the weirder stuff, the more alternative sect of online music, I would definitely give blush music a shot. And if you want something that requires a little bit less of a commitment on the length side, their album Mosaic and their first record, their self-titled, is also fantastic. These are great bodies of work that are totally worth exploring if you can get into them. And on the note of more gothically inclined stuff, <laughs> I initially conceived of this video as being five albums, like Riley's video was, but once I really thought about it, there was another album that I just couldn't leave off of this list, but is very underheard and underappreciated, and because it's from an artist and a voice that you probably wouldn't expect it to come from. This is the self-titled Casualties of Cool album from 2014. Casualties of Cool is a musical project that is spearheaded by one of my personal favorite musicians, Canadian prog legend Devin Townsend. Anybody who's a huge Devin head will tell you that this guy has more bands and musical projects than you can shake a fucking stick at, and one of my personal favorites really is Casualties of Cool, which is a team up with the singer Shay Amy Dorval. Devin essentially describes this album as his attempt to make a record that is nothing but ghostly remnants of Johnny Cash songs. And that's basically the best way I can sell this as being a kind of spectral afterimage of country and gothic country music. Aesthetically speaking, it's very ethereal in ways that are comparable to blush music, but feel like they exist in a world all their own, in my opinion, just because this album draws from even more disparate influences. There's ambient music on here, more traditional blues, ambient pop influences as well, but it is unmistakably still an alternative country record. And with the dynamic performances of the two vocalists, Devin and Amy, it creates a phenomenally beautiful blanket of sonic comfort. And this is kind of an unsettling and disquieting album for the most part. It has its moments where it certainly veers into something more intimidating and even frightening in nature, but it is still also a weirdly serene experience. And the structure of the album is kind of a reverse spiral. It starts in a way that feels more tangible. You can kind of latch on to what's happening in a more direct way, and then it just slowly unravels and almost becomes Lovecraftian in its final moments where it becomes very esoteric and 
almost grand. It's all of these elements being drawn together by a genre outsider that's applying these things in a way that I don't think other musicians would think to. In a way, this is kind of an, an outlier when it comes to this list, in that it is probably the least alternative Americana, but that's also because it's a dozen of other sects of country music at the same time. I cannot stress enough the core vocal presences on here of Devin, who is one of the greatest singers of all time, in my opinion, and one of the greatest performers, and he's really reining himself in, along with Shay Amy Dorval, who has a sensational singing voice. Both of these guys have great chemistry, but getting to hear them isolated on their own is just a treat in and of itself. I love losing myself to the winding journey of this album, and it's probably one of the albums on here that I've listened to the most. It's a lot of material, and it's pretty out there, but at the same time, if you still just can't get along with alternative country music, I still think that a lot of people would really revere this if they gave it a shot. I want to turn back to an album that is a little bit older than everything else on this list, and I feel like might be one of the prototypical examples of alternative country, and that is the incomparable Emmy Lou Harris and her album Wrecking Ball. This record in particular may have heralded some people applying this label retrospectively to albums that perhaps came before it. Emmy Lou Harris belongs to a very, very traditional sect of country music that started out in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. I'd also like to throw in an album like Loretta Lynn's album Van Leer Rose, which is another example of a sort of established country artist making a late career record and teaming up with a really notable producer and sort of exploring a, a facet of themselves that they maybe haven't capitalized on before. In that case, that is Loretta Lynn teaming up with Jack White for a very bluesy progressive country sound. Here, on the other hand, with Emmylou Harris, we have her teaming up with legend Daniel Lanois. And if you don't know who Daniel Lanois is, this guy has multiple collaborations with people like Bob Dylan. Time Out of Mind is, again, another example of sort of a folk artist making a late career masterpiece with one of these producers that sort of accentuates something fundamental about their sound, but also details that they get to refine. And that's very much the case here on Wrecking Ball. This is an album that's lyrical content is quite challenging. It's a very backward-looking record for Emmy Lou Harris. Where Will I Be, the opener, is mournful, and that perspective from which she writes is just so valuable. Country music has a complicated relationship with masculinity and with women and how it views women and treats women, but it's still fundamentally a movement that had women asserting themselves in a way that is probably a bit more egalitarian than some people would have you believe. You know, you've got people like Lucinda Williams who are in this vein, who I feel like are undeniable stalwarts. Emmy Lou is certainly one of those people, and she's been somebody who's collaborated with lots of different people over the years, and you feel like she's pulling from lots of different sounds on here, which Again, with Daniel Lanois' collaboration, with this step up production-wise, sounds absolutely immaculate. I love the sound of things like the final track, Waltz Across Texas Tonight, or the phenomenal Sweet Old World. The guitars on here are gentle, they're crisp. Emmy Lou's singing voice is as great as it's ever been, but just worn enough to really make you feel the passage of time that informs so much of this album. This is a classic in every sense of the word, and honestly, regardless of your overall interest in alternative Americana, this still should be given uh, priority when it comes to listening.
for my final entry on this list, I wanted to kind of marry the more accessible and inaccessible sides of the records that I've talked about thus far, and find a healthy middle ground of something that feels very experimental and exploratory, but is still so tethered to the core appeal of country music, and there's no better artist to do this with than another critical favorite of the modern country scene, Sturgill Simpson. Basically everything this guy has made is really amazing at taking elements of psychedelic rock, blues rock, some harder edged stuff, but these things come together nowhere better than on his record, A Sailor's Guide to Earth, my personal favorite record of his, and my god, look at that album cover. That's, that's one of the best album covers ever. And the best endorsement of this album I can give is that it sounds exactly like its album cover. This is a unique record because this is an album that is specifically Sturgill addressing his child, his son, essentially. And A Sailor's Guide to Earth is him framing his life experiences and stories as a sort of lesson, a letter to his son to, to live his life by. And it's presented with this grandeur that's scarcely seen in alternative Americana. Stuff like the opener, which is, I mean, just one of my favorite songs in general, honestly. Again, it's that scale, the operatic, just absolute weight of a song like this, but also it's, it's beautiful plaintive moment that it kind of starts in, the dynamics on this record are really something else to behold. And he does a lot of great classic storytelling, a lot of personal confessional writing that isn't out of place or too far divorced from people like Rustin Kelly or Jason Isbell, for example, but he does also do some weirder shit like cover Nirvana's In Bloom, which I think is a fantastic cover in and of itself, and just a great choice here as it is very much a song about masculinity uh, within a particular societal context and framed as a lesson to his son and a bit of imparted wisdom, it, it takes on a bit of a new meaning and I, I feel like his voice adds a lot too. There's so many moments on here that are absolutely overrunning with fantastic atmosphere, but also some really centralized core rock tunes. And for that reason, this is an easy recommendation unless your specific proclivities are just really opposed to what this is aesthetically. But even then, I still recommend that you give it a shot nonetheless. And that's gonna be it for six alternative country albums that you should listen to. Tell me what you think about these albums in the comments, and most importantly, if you've got your own recommendations, your own favorites, Drop them in the comments below because that's what I want videos like this to be. A breeding ground for talking about records that can get you into parts of music that you are unfamiliar with or just, you know, stuff that's maybe rubbed you the wrong way. There's always going to be a record of every genre for everybody because there's so many possibilities when it comes to music these days. And as always, folks, rock over London. Rock on Chicago, Ford, built tough.